The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, Morningstar IM, ABN 54071808501, AFSL 228986, and Clearbridge Investments Limited, ABN 84119339052, AFSL 307727, and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. How are you now? And welcome to the Ensemble Investment Podcast. My name is James Whelan, VFS Group Investment Manager, and I'm here to represent you, the humble advisor, doing their best to walk the line between client interests and asset class selection. We're trying to find the things that are not only appropriate, but that are actually working to be in the right things at the right weight for the right clients. So get set because myself and Morningstar are going to do our absolute best to answer some of the questions that have come up over the Ensemble platform. All the information contained is general in nature. So here we go. Morningstar Investment Management Australia is delighted to be sponsoring Ensemble's investment podcast series designed to equip advisors to have more meaningful conversations with clients. Morningstar Investment Management is a global leader in asset allocation, investment research and portfolio construction. Specialising in investing, behavioural coaching and practice optimization. Morningstar strives to give advisors the tools to confidently navigate their clients' complex needs. Morningstar, empowering investor success. This episode is brought to you by Clearbridge Investments. Clearbridge Investments is a global equity manager committed to delivering consistently superior risk-adjusted investment performance to investors. We pursue this goal through a combination of active, research-driven fundamental investing. A collaborative, team-based culture guides everything we do. How are you now and welcome to the Ensemble Investment Podcast brought to you by Morningstar. My name is James Whelan, VFS Group Investment Manager, and I'm here to represent you, the humble advisor, doing their best to walk the line between client interests and asset class selection. We are trying to find the things that are not only appropriate, but also the ones that actually work and maybe try and find the right time to be the right weight for the right clients. So get set because myself and Morningstar are going to do our best to answer some of the questions that have come up on the Ensemble platform. And obviously, all information contained is general in nature. So here we go. It's always when it's not there that we notice it. And uh, the last few years, the in the switch to renewables and various government policies, maybe a war or two, we've noticed it a little bit more. Infrastructure is not only important to a functioning society, but also to a functioning and diversified portfolio. James Whelan, King of Segway. Whilst in a low-rate environment, many areas in the sector played the role of bond proxies, a great term that was coined a few years ago, but now the bonds are actually paying something somewhere, then the beggars can actually now once again be considered choosers on portfolio allocation, but how much and where? Therein lies the question. So I couldn't ask for any two better names to help us crawl through the pipes of this question, again, beautiful pun, than Charles Hamey co-manager of Global Infrastructure Strategies at Clearbridge Investments. He's been there long enough to almost be part of the infrastructure there as well. <laughs> That's always a great sign in any fund that I look at. And also along from Morningstar is Senior Portfolio Manager, Bianca Rose. Bianca, Charles, how are you now? Great, I am thanks. very well. Thanks, James. Thank you. All right. Now, first off, uh, Charles, everyone gets the same question. It's a good way to set the mood. It's also a good way to just to talk about what it is that you do. What do you do and how do you make money? Okay. So, as you said, I run or co-manage for the listed infrastructure strategies at, at Cleavage Investments. And essentially, we are a global fund manager who invests in listed infrastructure. And if I go back to day one, our philosophy has always been the same. It's almost to take a, a private market's approach to a, assessing value in, in the sector, but at the same time, never ignoring the realities of what the market does. So use the beta of the market to add a return over and above what a, a typical infrastructure or asset would generate if you were a direct investor. And that was over 15 years ago, and certainly the passage of time has has pleasingly proven that uh, a really smart and sensible way to manage money in the sector and, and generate long-term returns for, for investors. Oh, cheers for that, Charles. Uh, Bianca, 
Similar question. Maybe not how you make money, but don't know. What do you do? Yeah. How do you make money? So we're multi-asset investors. So we'll look to you know invest across all asset classes, and we'll do that on behalf of retail and institutional clients. Um, so yeah, we start with our capital markets approach, where we just look at the kind of overall universe, and then say, okay, based on our value-oriented approach, you know what you know, are the areas that we want to invest in more and what do we want to invest in less? And that's kind of really it in a nutshell for us. Perfect. And that works out well. So, look, by the end of this podcast, if we can answer the, what you would think would be simple questions, why, where, how much and when with regards to infrastructure and various relations to it, um, I think that we've probably achieved it and, uh, and Clayton can pay me some money. Now, the, <laughs> let's get to it because that's what I'm here for. The uh, talking points. Now, I've got advisor questions that come off the platform from Ensemble and any advisors out there if you're on the platform ask more questions we're going to have more conversations like this and that's what the platform is for just trying to get your questions into the into the mouths of people like me and then again into the answers of people like my guests today so let's start really simply what is an infrastructure investment and what are some examples I'm going to go look I'm going to go left to right Bianca yeah, sure. Uh, so we just see it as essential systems that you need to, you know, have a well-functioning society, if you like. So they're usually essential services like, you know, your typical utility that kind of, you know, provides your gas, electricity, you name it, water, um, and also, you know, stuff like airports, uh, toll roads, basically transportation infrastructure, those kind of the major areas that we think of. Um, now, the characteristics of infrastructure investments that make them attractive to investors. This is a really easy. I guess we, start, we start off with the easy ones. It's, it's, right, it's a good way to discuss I'll, I'll why you need one. what I do. Yeah, go, go Charles, it's all with you. Well, as Bianca said, they're an essential service. And because of that, they have quite low elasticity to economic, economic outcomes. So you get very high resilience of cash flows, you know, whether we're in a recession or not. People still typically use water, gas, electricity, and they'll still even drive on toll roads and, 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 and you know, take flights, et cetera. And once you get that really resilient cash flow, it does allow these companies to pay dividends and dividends which are dividend growth, which is linked more to asset-based growth. So dividends which can grow much faster than a typical through the cycle inflation rate. And that's sort of the, the, the you know, the, the, the main reasons. And the outcome of that is really strong portfolio diversification. And an asset class which in really volatile markets has the ability to preserve capital, so really strong downside protection, yet in rising markets can capture the appropriate amount of upside as well. So yep. it's quite unique to, to infrastructure. I remember one of the uh, one of the beautiful dawning moments of my young broking career, it would have been back in 2005, when I was, I was a, a young whippersnapper, dealer's assistant's assistant, and I heard an advisor saying it was the most simple, the, the most simple argument that he made about investing in a toll road, which is that as – the toll goes up, they charge people more, less people will use it. Theoretically, there's a little bit of elasticity in that. Less people will use it, which actually make it quicker to drive on, so then more people will, will, will go back and use it. And it, it's effectively just a never-ending rotation through there. Now, I'm not entirely sure if that theory works, but it's it's very similar to sort of… Um, well, it has worked a lot of toll roads around the world, hasn't it? <laughs> um, and uh, that's why toll roads are such great investments through the cycle, definitely. Uh, now, as a diversifier, uh, Bianca, I'm looking at you on this one. So, uh, where do you see the benefits of, of utilizing infrastructure in a portfolio from a diversification uh, perspective? Yeah, so I think it definitely complements growth assets that tend to be more about capital growth. And this does tend to be more about that income profile. It will vary across the infrastructure you know, types, but generally we do see this as suitable for people who are focused on income. Um, also looking for, as, as you kind of noted, Charles, you know, that kind of, you know, through the cycle, economic downturns and so on, utilities in particular within the infrastructure space tend to be more stable in terms of their earnings profile. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so now I'm going to have to talk about the I word, inflation. Now we're not going to have a view on inflation <laughs> because everyone's had a view and everyone's been different. Congratulations to all players. It is higher. It, it, it's, it does seem like the perspective is that it is going to be higher for a little bit longer than potentially what people thought that it was going to be doing. It's a, it's a tough slog to get it from six down to two. Does that, Charles, I, I'm, I'm going to go to you. How has it changed the, the ease at which an infrastructure investment has, has made it with inflation? First off, how does inflation and infrastructure connect together? And then I'm going to, and I'll be jumping ahead. And then how do we, how do we get to the next part? So, Again, one of the really unique features of, of the asset class, whether it's a, a user pays asset like a toll road um, or an airport or a utility, is that there is mechanisms enshrined in regulation or concession agreements that allow the owner of the asset to pass through inflation. And that's sort of 
been one of the real attractiveness, uh, attractive uh, characteristics of, of the asset class since inception, um, but certainly came to the fore over the last couple of years. And that's really a function of a couple of things. You know, one is how they generate revenue, you know, the contractual or, or regulated environment they do so. Um, and the second is the market structure. So typically they're oligopoly or monopoly assets. So they should be regulated and they should sort of earn a return for investing their asset bases. And finally, you do have, and again, as I said earlier, an asset class where the revenue is, you know, is very resilient. Again, which lends itself to being able to pass through, pass through inflation and, and retain that sort of that, that, that free cash flow. And, you know, when you put all those together, um, it really came to a fall last year. And as you said, certainly our view is somewhat similar in terms of just that last mile of inflation will probably be more difficult for central banks and governments to, you know, to moderate. So having inflation protection, um, is probably still a very attractive, you know, thing to have in the context of a portfolio. Can't, can't deny it, but we've, so, and, and at the top, I did mention that beautiful uh, phrase, which I say that I coined. I'm not entirely sure that I did. Um, that inflation, higher inflation, has led to uh, to higher bond yields. It has uh, better alternatives. Therefore, the need for the bond proxy that that a lot of infrastructure investments were. Challenge me on this, please. Um, that that uh, that the bond proxies that infrastructure was seen as potentially yep. means that you can be a bit, maybe not picky, but it's a bit difficult, a bit more difficult to find the alternative that's going to yield higher. At a similar risk area, yeah. I'm going to leave. I'm going to leave well, that with you. And on come the, at me. Go. That's what. I that's what, that's back what we, on the yeah. on the the bond proxy statement. It's similar to inflation. You know, interest rates are passed through the allowed return. So at any point in the cycle, when you know, regulators working out the allowed return amongst other parts of, of of regulation, you know, the allowed return is a pretty accurate representation of the prevailing cost of capital and cost of equity. So in a higher interest rate environments. The allowed return will also be higher to reflect that. So you do get an inflation pass through of, 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 of interest rates as well. And the bond proxy with a bit of growth, I mean, if you think about the asset based growth that we're seeing now acro- across many of our utilities, you know, it's almost double digits. So these are essential services. So water assets, gas assets, electricity assets, um, in sometimes very mature networks, still growing their asset bases by up to 10%. And that's not. You know, a bond proxy. That's sort of a company paying you a three or four percent dividend yield, but growing at ten percent a year. So there is a huge amount of growth, structural growth as well. And we can touch touch upon that a bit later. So yeah. I always push back on the bond proxy because I'd love a bond that was you know growing its dividend at ten percent a year as well. That's uh, so. There, so, so a bond proxy in yield, but not growth. I suppose is most is, definitely. Yeah, that's right, Bianca. Similar question for you with with regards to how you see that. Fitting into the portfolio with a higher with higher risk free rate, I'm going to say risk free rate. It's a higher risk backed by the U.S. Navy, effectively the ten year bond. The with a higher risk free rate, where do you see the pickiness that you can have inside internally in, in an infrastructure investment? Yeah, so I mean, I guess we think about yeah the interaction between inflation, um, interest rates, and also economic conditions. So you know, we spoke briefly about transportation infrastructure. I think that's you know one that with economic conditions, the the traffic volumes and so on can change. Whereas a, a utility is a little bit more uh, less variable. Is is kind of you know, um, and we can get to this topic later. Part of that transition to you know the you know the new energy kind of what is our new energy source? Oh, yeah, I've got a, I've got a whole uh, section marked yeah, for that stuff. That's um, good. And, you know, utilities will have to be part of that solution. Um, the only thing I will say is on, on that return on investment, it does depend on the regulatory kind of environment. So Certainly. in Europe, for instance, it's probably not as favorable as the US. I think the US in terms of earning that rate of return is much easier uh, to kind of get by the various regulators in the different, um, let's call it, you know, councils or municipalities in the, you know, um, within the US. But in Very Europe- Very diplomatically put <laughs> Uh, within Europe, we, we do find that um, this is kind of where the politics of the regulatory environment comes in. And what you tend to find is that more the southern European guys who um, have, you know, um, I guess debt issues and so on tend to pick on the utilities a little bit and don't let them earn those, those rates of um, return. So it does mean you do also need to pick and choose where you are. Okay. And so, so do you want to just get straight into the, whilst we're here, let's just go straight into the transition to renewables and then we can come back to it. Since we're both sort of keyed up, or sorry, we're all sort of keyed up on the idea. And you mentioned Europe before and sort of listening to, to, to the situation that Europe's in now, yes. particularly maybe some of the regulatory issues that you've got. You've yeah. got Germany that's winding down 
it's nuclear. Yes. You've got Spain, which is quite sunny and therefore favourable for solar panels. You've got a Germany that was looking at potentially replacing this nuclear wind down with gas from Russia, which is now not really as much of a possibility for various reasons in there. That The, the European situation and their transition to renewables has been maybe stickier than they would have liked it ideally. What do you see? Now, let's not talk about the specifics of Europe, but let's talk about <laughs> generally speaking. I just like that as an example of just going, yeah. it's not an easy flick to switch. No, um, it's definitely transition. not. Um, and, and I mean, I'll let you comment more, Charles, obviously, but, um, you know, it, it, we know that we're going to have to change in the future in terms of um, energy resources and, and um, where we kind of source them from. The question is um, for the utilities guys, particularly in Europe as well, we're seeing the energy guys get into that space as well in terms of renewables. So there is a bit of competition of who does what yep. um, from a capital supply perspective. Um, and and the world is changing because, the you know, as you, you mentioned, nuclear, I think, you know, what we saw with Japan many years ago with the, you know, the, the plant um, issues there with the earthquakes and so on. So it, I think it's sort of something that uh, governments are kind of always trying to think what's the solution and then they might change sometimes course. Yeah. Um, so Again, that, that's, very diplomatic on these ones. Yeah. So, so, you, can, you can say what you feel. Yeah. So, so okay. it, it, but we'll, for utilities which are very long dated assets where you have to make a commitment up front and you're looking at quite a long time, that's really problematic. Mm. Um, so um, so there's a lot of good things on the horizon, but there's also some challenges on the horizon. Any any key challenges and opportunities? I'm gonna I'm gonna open this up and just bounce back and forth between all of us on this one and the challenges and opportunities on the on the transition to renewables from an infrastructure investments space. I think we we will all underestimate the opportunity, and history shows that as it relates to infrastructure spend, we always underestimate just how much money is required. So opportunity is immense, but when you're spending potentially trillions and trillions of dollars to get anywhere near net zero, that a question is who's going to pay for it. So then the affordability equation and what framework is best to ensure that there's more of a socialization of the cost. And that's sort of the, the work in progress, I think. Less so in North America, probably more so in Europe, as Bianca said. Um, but that said, I don't really think, and we don't really think, that those, you know, those challenges – will outweigh the opportunity. When you think about, you know, decarbonization net zero, changing the way energy is generated, changing the way it moves around society, changing the way we move around society, at almost every point, an infrastructure investment is required. So utilities, and even user pays, that's like toll roads and airports, are really right at the forefront of, of that push or that transition. So there's going to be significant opportunities across every utility, both listed and direct, to take advantage of that and to invest in very high quality assets and earn very attractive returns in the process. And quite often those returns just as part of asset base and earning a, an allowed return. But the path won't be linear and there's going to be risks along the way. And that's our job as active managers to navigate that and the company's jobs to navigate that. But certainly from our point of view, um, whilst the challenges are real, the opportunities are absolutely immense. And yeah. that's the more exciting part of the equation. I have been a big focus. Uh, sorry, I've had a big focus for the last few last few years, I suppose, on this, on, the, on the wealth transfer and the transition that we're going to have. The portfolio of our grandparents, with regards to an infrastructure position, is going to look a lot different to now. What will our grandchildren? I mean, gen generally speaking, you're not going to know specifics, fifteen you know, percent or anything like that. What's a portfolio probably going to look like in twenty years' time or thirty years' time? Is it, is it going to be is it going to be something that's in maybe carbon capture? That we're going to see as as we, as we move towards that zero and actually start to to, to 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 shoot it back into the earth. I think what's most interesting, James, is that a lot of the people don't really sort of understand this, but a lot of the technology innovation that's occurring now within infrastructure is occurring within utilities themselves. If you think about hydrogen, think about carbon capture, a lot of our technology right at the forefront, or the missing links required to achieve net zero, it's the large scale utilities in North America, in Europe, even in Asia. You know, which are committing the necessary R and D and the capex to sort of drive that forward. So we don't really see an environment where it'll be too different in terms of large utilities, airports, toll roads, etc. Because at the end of the day, as the point was made earlier, they're essential services. You know, imagine a society with no infrastructure. I've been to a few of those countries in my you know traveling emerging markets. Yeah. Um, so the role of the infrastructure won't change. How you navigate around that will at the edges, but certainly. 
you know, I think where it's quite pleasing to see just how committed the utilities are globally to being right at the forefront of that pioneering technology design or needed to get anywhere near net zero by 2050. Well, Bianca, now I know you've got a background in ESG. Please nod, yes, because yes, I, 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 the, the, the research <laughs> that I did did have ESG next to your name there yes. a, a few times. So, uh, based on what Charles has just said, then mm. if you've got if you've got the the utes, the, sorry, the utilities doing the job of the future, where does where does an infrastructure holding sit on an ESG spectrum? Yeah, so it's a really good question. Um, it, it's the path. Um, is, is what I'm going to say because um, some of them are not there today, but they may well be. Um, and and just on that, I mean, as well, we're talking a lot about utilities, but it also affects the airports and the toll roads right? Go on. in yeah. terms of, you know, when we think of the airports, they also have to come up with solutions for the airlines. So this is kind of an issue for them because their kind of main customer is very high carbon, you know, emitting. Um, so it, it isn't just an issue that's confined to utilities being part of the solution. It's also about transportation infrastructure. So the minute we move, and we need to move, we're social beings, but the minute we do, we're emitting, you know, carbon. So um, we've got to, you know, we've got to think about our sources as well for transportation infrastructure. So the way we kind of see it is there's probably going to be, um, I mean, you mentioned hydrogen, Charles, like there's going to be transitions in different kind of sources, if you like, and where the end result is going to be, it's really hard to say in 20 years' time. Okay. Is there anything else that's in that transition to renewables area that you wanted to touch on? Because that, that was all the questions that I had on that. Is there mm. anything that's further on that? No? No, I mean, not, not to touch on, but again, I would reiterate just how exciting of an opportunity is. Certainly, you know, the companies in our universe and utilities and infrastructure companies more generally are right at the forefront of, of that transition. Okay. Uh, and we're going to switch back now to economic cycles. What we're seeing, um, and this is just a simple factual sort of question on, on this from one of our advisors, does infrastructure perform differently in different in economic cycles and under different governments? Definitely. I mean, I mentioned Europe yes. <laughs> um, in terms of government. So depends, you can be, spe- you know. be, be please be specific on, on, on these as well. Like what sort of, what sort of, what sort of campaigning you'd like to see, what sort of groundswell of, or movement and then sort of potentially maybe some of the opportunities, Charles, that you'd look for in, say, a region or a sector that is moving in a certain direction. That would be a, a, a fantastic mm. way of being able to fit these things together. Yeah, so uh, I mentioned specifically in Europe the, the southern states, so Italy, Spain, because they tend to be more indebted, they need the infrastructure, but they're just not prepared to, um, I guess, put on the cost, if mm-hmm. you like. And so a lot of these utilities companies end up doing these investments for the greater good of society, but don't necessarily get the return from that. Um, in the US, it is a different situation where they generally tend to be more successful in terms of working with um, like regulatory bodies and various governments to get the required rate of return that is required to make these investments. But it, it does, you know, it just depends. And and likewise for the European airports, sometimes they come across issues as well um, with the, the governments and so on. So, see, the, these are just some of the challenges. Yeah. Charles, what, what, what would a manager be looking for? Maybe not you specifically, obviously, but, you know, just Yeah, obviously general. you need some – Stability in that public policy outcome and that regul, you know, that, that sort of the regulatory framework over multiple cycles, whether it's a utility or an airport, and certainly in Southern Europe, um, there's been some challenges. But again, from our point of view, those challenges have not have not sort of impacted the opportunity. Certainly, the opportunity we see in Italy, with you know a few companies there, even in Spain um, to a lesser extent, there is still significant opportunity. And as with every investment, it's understanding you know, how you price the risk and in a sense sort of stepping back and reflecting on the range of outcomes around sort of a base case valuation. And a lot of those regulatory issues, certainly as it relates to maybe electricity networks in Spain, you consider it in your range of outcomes. And so when building a portfolio, you know, if there's a wider range of outcomes, then you may temper your enthusiasm to go to a, you know, a higher weight. But that's what you do when you build portfolios. So, you know, the job of active management is to understand the risk and price the risk and, and, and try to make money, try to when the market gets it wrong and hopefully the market moves to our direction. So certainly whilst, you know, there is sort of on occasion, you know, very sort of cause to temper enthusiasm um, for some assets in Europe. The US is different, as you said, Bianca, it's like it's a nominal ROE, it's state-based regulation. There's a huge competition for capital in North America. And so 
you know, normal ROEs have been stubbornly high now for a long, long, long period of time. Um, whereas in Europe, it's much more, it, well, it is sort of a, a real base system of regulation where you do get passed through of inflation and interest, interest rates. So allowed returns with a very low, you know, interest rate environment have been much lower, even when you sort of try to make them like for like. So that's, again, all part of the, the twos and fro's of investing. Yeah. Um, and you mentioned economic conditions. When we think of transportation infrastructure, that's definitely, you know, something that will ebb and flow with economic cycles, probably, you know, um, more so than utilities. So if you're going to go traveling, say, for, for holiday travel and so on, that's probably going to be curbed back. Business travel is going to be curbed back. Yep. Um, you won't be spending as much in, um, you know, when you think of the airports, half of their revenue is usually from retail. So it's kind of like retail property in a way. It's kind of not just infrastructure. Yeah. And so you'll probably spend less in the, you know, kind of malls and the shops and so on in the airports. So we kind of tend to regard the transportation infrastructure as usually the more economically sensitive part of infrastructure, say, versus utilities. Okay. So, that, so yep. And anyone who can piece together how that works, that's your job and that's, and that's what we can do. Economic cycle and where that's going to fit into. Next one that I've got is one of the narratives we sometimes hear about infrastructure is around the lack of transparency and liquidity. Now, Charles, I know that you've got an answer for this. Is this issue real? Well, I suppose in the listed market, no. You know, the share price is you see you know, what you see what's under the, the ultimate under the source board, of truth, right? right? Yeah. Yeah. The collective wisdom of thousands of people who buy and sell that stock. Yep. In the direct market, it's probably a bit different, where you have you know yearly valuations, and you know certainly they're independent, and you couldn't challenge that. But you know what we've seen in the listed market for some time now is quite a large gap between many of the transaction multiples in direct infrastructure and the trading multiples in listed companies being much lower. And they're the same asset quite often, um, sometimes even the same regulator and sometimes even very similar capital structures. So just justifying that gap, I think, is becoming harder and harder. So it doesn't surprise me that you've had a bit more regulatory noise in Australia in particular recently about the value that a lot of these direct assets are being held on the balance sheets or within the investment funds of industry funds, for example. Yeah. And that's across both infrastructure and property and a bunch of you know, other- Particularly in property now, I think, is, direct is, is assets. the real question so, that's coming up on these ones, yeah. I think the passage of time will we'll, you know, we'll, we'll play that out. Yeah. Um, but what, what we've seen is that listed companies have benefited because when you do have a very large valuation gap, you know, three things can really happen. Um, you know, one is a direct investor will just buy the listed company. And you saw that a couple of years ago, Sydney Airport, Spark Infrastructure, Osnet, and you see it globally. Mm -hmm. What it's also allowed more recently is many listed companies to sell non-core assets to direct investors. I mean, they take those proceeds and reinvest in their very high quality core businesses. But thirdly, and probably most importantly, if you're – ambiguous to how or not ambiguous if, you, if you're sort of ambivalent to how you want to get exposure to the sector then as a listed investor you know right now buying a listed vehicle or a listed stock sorry you probably will earn a higher return through the cycle and that's purely because of a lower entry price um, so you know the what we see in the direct market does have quite positive you know read throughs in terms of valuation for the listed market well, that answers, answers it for me. Now we're going to come to the last two questions, then I'm going to have to call it at this one. Uh, Bianca, does does it – this is a, a, just reading the questions here. Does it have a role in all portfolios or is it more suited to a specific category of investor? So we have it in our multi-asset portfolios and we always have, a, you know, um, an allocation, but it varies yes. at different times. At the moment, we have a lower exposure to it uh, just because uh, we feel that um, yes, we take the point about, you know, where it sits versus unlisted, um, you know, kind of valuations and we do monitor the unlisted valuations and in the infrastructure space. But we just feel that there is probably better opportunities for us elsewhere at the moment. Yep. For our more income portfolios that we have, like, say, offshore within our group, we'll have more infrastructure because we kind of see that as having you know, more of that role for the income-focused investor, just like real estate, which you mentioned before. So that's probably another area that, you know, um, income-focused investors, you know, enjoy. Um, but we do kind of look at it against, I guess, bonds and so on. Um, yeah, evaluate there. 
and I'll close it off now, uh, and then I'll call last bids. I always do give everyone a last chance to speak. How and how can infrastructure be accessed from an investment perspective for either either one? Now, not talk a specific book, but uh, so, just I mean, I think we talked way. about yeah. unlisted versus listed. I mean, I think it comes down to as well the size of the investor. Yep. I think for smaller yep. investors, definitely listed. Um, you know, and and as noted, we do see a valuation gap. I think where the large investors are attracted to direct infrastructure or going unlisted is because they've just got so much money that they have to go and buy a big asset themselves. And also they're looking for control of the asset because, you know, quite frankly, quite a few years ago during GFC, a number of the large investors were in unlisted funds um, and couldn't get out. Um, so now they are looking to own the assets themselves so that they can hopefully sell the stakes themselves and yep. have more control. So I think it just depends on what they're looking for. It does come down to that liquidity and the cost of liquidity being paid to not be liquid as well as it d- does enter into that conversation as well. Yeah, it yes. does. I mean, surprisingly globally, um, it's, you know, the, the role of listed infrastructure relative to direct has really changed. Yeah, um, go on. So increasingly, Listed infrastructure now is taking that core role of infrastructure because it's very hard. I know you made the point, Bianca, about having huge, raising huge amounts of money in direct trying to invest it. They've had no luck in investing it. There's still three or four hundred billion dollars US dollars of dry powder sitting in direct, you know, waiting to be called to be invested. So they've had no luck because the high quality assets, the core assets, are no longer available. Really, they're all listed. So increasingly, global managers um, uh, are using listed infrastructure to sort of satisfy that core part of their portfolio and then complement it with, you know, direct exposure. Trying to find some stuff on the sides. Yeah, and, and yeah, quite so often. Yeah, add to yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. And, 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 and unless you're very, very big, you know, you have no control. Even yeah. as a direct investor, it's very rare that you're of a size where you can buy control. You're typically yeah, usually co-owning with someone. Yeah, so – Again, we always say that enlisted, um, well, you know, that a lot of those reasons to buy direct are a bit overstated. Um, and certainly the passage of time has definitely shown that through the cycle that the risk return outcomes in being listed or direct are, are very, very similar. And the return outcomes in listed are slightly higher because active management in listed does allow you to take advantage of what the market gives you in terms of a beta and add another layer another layer of return over and above just buying and holding an asset and waiting for someone to you know, buy it off you in 10 years' time. Perfect. Well, I think that we've managed to answer a few of the questions here. The why, where, how much, when. Also talking about infrastructure from a lower volatility, stable cash flow, potentially inflation protection uh, viewpoint and also from a liquidity viewpoint as well. Have we touched on all of these things? Last bids for anyone to speak now or forever hold your peace. <laughs> I will say, James, though, what we have seen is, you know, in Australia, perhaps maybe a, a more tempered weight more recently of infrastructure across portfolios, diversified portfolios, globally the absolute opposite. So we're right in the cusp now of globally in particular, you know, people now increasing their weight to infrastructure, um, you know, quite aggressively yep, yep. Um, and sort of uh, – playing a role as that diversifier with downside protection and upside capture and then sort of piecing a portfolio around it. And that's sort of perhaps where Australia was not long ago, um, but certainly globally, uh, that's where they are now. Excellent. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, my name has been – my name is my name is still James Whelan. It uh, has been for the duration of this podcast, VFS Group Investment Manager. And I would like to thank my guests here, Senior Portfolio Manager at Morningstar, Bianca Rose – and, and co-manager of global infrastructure strategies at Clearbridge Investments, Charles Hamey. Thank you so much. Thank you very Thank much. You. Cheers. If you want any more information, please go to the Ensemble platform, ask more questions, various websites and links to this podcast as well. Thank you so much for joining us. Mm-hmm.